Welcome to webinar 4, Use and Let Reuse, Digitization, Data Enrichment and Access at Natural Museum. Karin Glaseman has a PhD in History and is a Digital Coordinator at Natural Museum, Sweden's Museum of Art and Design. She is also Chair of Europeana Copyright Community. Karin is responsible for streamlining the internal digitization processes at the museum and for making sure that the digitized collections can be found, accessed, used and reused by the public. So welcome Karin, thanks uh, for joining us today and we're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you Wasa and uh, thank you Larissa, uh, thank you Anna for inviting me and organizing this event. Um, so I'm not now going to try and share my screen here, I hope it works well. Uh, let use and let reuse is what I've uh, decided to call the presentation and it's um, quite nice now to speak after our first brilliant presentation by Koralinka because um, she laid a lot of theoretic ground for what um, you could call a reality check now. So we will look at digitization, data enrichment and access at the National Museum. And um, I will talk about, not talk so much about um, controlled vocabularies, but you um, may want to have that back in mind. And um, I'll try to make some links anyway to that. Um, <clears throat> so what I'm gonna talk about is um, first, a very short introduction of who we are, then what I mean with use your data, because um, <clears throat> as the presentation is called, use and let reuse. I'm quite convinced that museums um, and heritage organizations should learn to use their data themselves as well. Um, and then what we mean by let reuse. So who are we? As Larissa said, I work for uh, the National Museum in Stockholm. Um, it is called National Museum, but uh, I always tend to say that when I present it in English, it's actually a national gallery. So we're Sweden's Museum of Art and Design. We were founded in 1866, a host a growing collection of 700,000 works of art, that is painting, sculptures, prints and drawings, and applied art and design. Um, and as uh, I, I know now, a lot of museums, of course, have been closed and are preparing for reopening. But for us, this was a reality already a bit earlier. Um, the museum closed due to renovation in 2013 and has then been closed for five and a half years and we reopened in October 2018 before we closed again on 20th of March 2020 and we will reopen again on Tuesday, which is uh, very nice. So what do I mean by use your data? I think it's important that we make sure museums know the value of their data and they know what it can be used for. So my hypothesis, my hypothesis is that in order to successfully enrich museum collections with meaningful metadata um, and <clears throat> in order to make sure that there can be meaningful collaborations around this metadata, there is the need to be for an internal use case. Because otherwise digitization and access activities always run the risk to become satellite activities that are detached from the everyday museum work. Um, <clears throat> And that is also some, always also something that uh, gets a lower priority from the rest of the everyday museum work. So to exemplify this, I would like to go back a bit in time and look at the challenges the National Museum was facing a couple of years ago. So when the museum closed um, <clears throat> its doors for the first time since 1866 in 2013, we were forced to move and document uh, over 4, 400,000 objects out of the galleries and storages. Um, some of them were moved for the first time since 1866. Um, and we had to prepare the new exhibition of about 500,000 objects. And <clears throat> there was also a need for more extensive catalogization of 700,000 objects. Now a move more, normally is not a scenario where you think of data enrichment at once. But for us, it was indeed a starting point for a more holistic approach to our collections data. Um, <clears throat> so the thing is that because we, for the first time, had to ensure basic registration and documentation of everything that left the house, um, even if it was only at the most basic level, 
we were finally in a position where a lot of collections were documented in a digital system at 100 percent which mean, meant we could develop a joint vision around the collection management system to become a tool for the whole organization, providing reliable metadata on the collection for all use cases. So the first focus was <clears throat> minimal documentation for as many objects as possible in order to switch the management of the collection um, totally to the digital tool. Now, some of you who don't work in museums might think that this is the normal case and those of you I would like to tell that the starting point of most museums <clears throat> is that there often is a more or less useful collection management system for internal management of collection data in place but often large parts of the collection are not registered or digitized which is a big problem when it comes to external collaboration as Cora also pointed out during the discussion uh, earlier on because um, these collections are not digitized, run the risk to um, head further down and down in the prioritization. Images and text files with additional information to the collection are often organized like a digital version of a traditional archive, which means that um, even we as internal staff need to know exactly where to look and what to look for in order to find information. Um, <clears throat> So, as I tend to say, for if, if you look at this wonderful interface from uh, the late 1980s, for most museum professionals with a digital profile or with a digital job description, this is about as sexy as it gets. And <clears throat> while researchers in digital humanities or specialists in linked open data or artificial intelligence might think that this is not exactly your problem, I would like to remind all of us that this is how most of the data around museum, library and archive collection still is captured. So it's, there's a lot of manual work involved and there's only when the, this basic layer of information has come into being that we can actually make use of all the enormous possibilities that digital technology offers. So my point is in order to come up with decent process projects and research questions for the digital humanities fields, we really need to acknowledge how the data is captured and why it is captured like that. So what does this have to do <coughs> with um, internal use in the museum? Well, even if we <coughs> could take the first steps in enriching the collection data from the beginning during the renovation process, the whole project really took off um, enormously when we were preparing the reopening during 2017 and 2018 because a big um, <clears throat> because it was then that we actually streamlined the um, documentation process in the database with the um, preparations of the new collection display. A big precondition of being able to take this step was actually the bulk registration that took place during the museum's closure and also the acquisition of a digital asset management system. So some of the prere prerequisites for better collection data is indeed better technical infrastructure. But from my point of view, there's no doubt that the infrastructure you have in place can make um, that the most important step is that you actually use the infrastructure that you have in place now and what kind of infrastructure is will make this process easier or harder but I think a big problem is that a lot of museums um, do not make use of the possibilities they actually have. For us this meant defining diet guidelines for documentation together with the project lead of the new collection display because like that we would ensure that the correction or addition of data in combination with the new collection was documented centrally and sustainably in the collection management system. I think it's important to understand when talking about collection data that a lot of institutions actually face a traditional gap between long-term digitization and cataloging processes. And the short-term needs for exhibition projects or digital communication are on a different side of the agenda. And strangely enough, uh, research projects often fall under this short-term category. There's a project team, and there is a project result which is <clears throat> which produces amazing content and sometimes even technology um, and they carry out scientific research a lot of facts are added or double checked and updated 
The material is then published and the publications are archived, but often there's no connection to ongoing digitization or cataloging work. So when National Museum was renew reviewing information for over 5,000 objects that were going to be exhibited in the new collection display, we needed to make sure that they reviewed and additional content would be saved in the collection database for further use. Um, which, let me just see, yeah. So, which meant that apart from focusing on all digitization activities around the new collection display, we made sure that thematic ideas and curatorial information were documented in the collection management system, excuse me. Um, <clears throat> and this was easiest ensured by producing the labels directly from the collection management system because by that we would make sure that the fact checking process, which is part of any exhibition, was actually entwined with the digital catalogue and we by that made sure that the database became a more and more reliable source of information for the exhibition planning period. Um, a second project <clears throat> which led to more, better and even more usable data was the need for a new visitor guide app. Here it was important to focus on that we didn't again, copy data to yet another presentation forum, that this wouldn't be like, again, another digital project that would take off on its own. But <clears throat> we wanted to make sure that this also uh, would boost our internal infrastructure. So the visitor guide app was developed. Here you see the presentation, the um, uh, export out of the collection management database to produce uh, our exhibition labels. And this is how the same object looks in the visitor guide app. Now this visitor guide app was developed for a specific need that the um, exhibition lead saw in the new galleries. Precisely, we wanted to be able to present a lot of objects without having to inflict the aesthetics with a lot of labels. And I guess there would have been a lot um, of solutions for our needs. But as I said, we tried to size the opportunity to make sure that the digital development for a public need would also be a boost for our internal infrastructure when it comes to digitization and documentation. Because it is indeed so that very few museum directors understand we need to spend a lot of money for an open API. This is a very difficult um, conversation or a difficult um, uh, topic to win um, because you, as we all know we all live on very restricted budgets and so every development project is um, conquering with another exhibition actually with a with a different project in the museum everyday life which normally is an exhibition and very few museum directors will invest in an open API when they instead can have another exhibition but it was much easier to run this um, discussion saying like we need to spend a lot of money to be able to show information on all of those objects beautifully for the public in an app and this is how we actually developed our our open api on which we built the um the application for the public um, I just showed these two images that there was a specification in 2017, precisely in summer 2017, and the app was actually launched in October 2018. And it holds information on every object that is exhibited in the National Museum, and it also holds a photograph of every museum that is exhibited in the museum. So you can actually um, explore all the exhibits um, via your mobile phone. And Again, the fact that we chose to offer this was a big boost to our internal documentation and digitization process because suddenly everybody understood why everything needed to be digitized and why everything needed to be catalogued and double checked and um, um, yeah, catalogued correctly. But of course, um, <clears throat> or of course, when the API then was in use, it opened for more possibilities, which were both external use and also internal, um, more internal experiments. So internally, as we had now an easy way to get to our own collection data, and I've um, 
pasted the link to the API in uh, my presentation. What we did was to, um, <clears throat> we used it to be able to show our collection data in a more curated and in a more, um, <clears throat> uh, more engaging way in our main website. Because something that Cora also said was that people will not always find the, um, the portals that will actually provide them with information around collections that they're looking for. So we wanted to make sure that we catch the random visitor to the National Museum and show that you can actually dive deeper into the National Museum collections, uh, which, <clears throat> which is a curated selection, but from every object in that curated selection, you will get a link into the online database where you can research further on. And as I said, of course, the API opened up for external reuse. And with that, I turn to the second question of my presentation, which is, what do I mean by let reuse? And please excuse my <laughs> slightly flat joke. It's easy. What I mean is let people reuse your data. Because I think that most important thing we as cultural heritage institutions need to learn in the discussion around how to make our collection data available for amazing research or engagement projects is to let go of the idea that we as an institution or that we as institutions can or should control what the data is being used for or by whom it is in use. So please make your data available as open as possible. And even if I have now <clears throat> for the last 12 minutes talked about um, our own infrastructure and how we needed to um, do changes to our infrastructure to streamline our digitization and documentation processes, uh, please do not get the impression that you need to build a lot of new infrastructure to make your data available to external partners because instead use the infrastructure that is already there. And I guess Larissa will give you some more ideas on how to best do this uh, this afternoon, or she maybe did that yesterday afternoon. <laughs> I only know that it was part of the webinar, sorry. So um, for National Museum, it made this idea that we want, to <clears throat> we want to let people reuse our data means that we in 2016 adopted an open glam policy, which put all our images of two dimensional works of art into the public domain. And reaching this decision was not an easy process. But finally, it was an easy decision because maximum openness is really the only way to fulfill our mission as a state finance museum. And our director general explains the national explains this open glam um, policy as follows. The National Museum belongs to all of us and so do the images. And I would like to add and thus also the metadata around those images. They are to be used and enjoyed at all levels. We hope that our open collection will continue to inspire creative new reuses and interpretations. So <clears throat> during the renovation, we did not only prepare new physical exhibitions, we did even experiment with new channels and succeeding in new solutions for digital storytelling, like um, those web tours that I just showed you. It might look like a neglectable detail, but we made sure when we produced those new sort of ways of um, opening entries to our collection that the open access policy and thus the open licenses always got a very prominent place. I really cannot stress this enough, but actually taking the decision to open up your data or open up your collection is only part of the change. It's just as important to make sure over and over again that researchers, creatives, and all other communities interested in reusing your data do understand that they are welcome to do so. So here you see when it comes to the public facing interfaces such as our visitor guide app and the main website, we have chosen to translate the uh, public domain mark also into uh, just a simple, simple language sentence saying this image is free to use. And of course, I know that not all museums are able to just place all of their um, visual <clears throat> data into the public domain. Please make sure that it is as open as possible. Um, 
yeah, for those of you who still think that I am exaggerating, I just want to say that more than one third of art historians have avoided or abandoned work in their field because of copyright concerns. So our material really needs to be out there among the researchers and it needs to be very clear that communities are allowed to use it as they see fit. So let's take a look at those external platforms I mentioned earlier. Um, <clears throat> For National Museum, the um, journey towards more openness started actually in 2013 when we started um, when we started exporting our data to Europeana. And in 2014, something happened that none of us had foreseen, and that is that Wikimedia Sweden downloaded data, only metadata, because we haven't done we hadn't done any open licenses on our images at, uh, yet. So Wikimedia Sweden downloaded data on 6,500 paintings to Wikidata by Europeana's API. We then corrected and completed some data and provided data on all artists in the, in our, from our internal database to Kulturnav, uh, which is the culture hub. There's also um, a, uh, a lot of information on the site kulturnav.se, which were also linked to existing artists on Wikidata and the correspondent paintings. So Wikidata, in my opinion, works as a fantastic hub um, also to connect your own data to all kinds of controlled vocabularies, um, <clears throat> which we have tested for our, for our um, artists' databases. So we could later on re-import links to authorities like the Getty Union list of artists' names or the VF by this connection. And when we finally released the images into the public domain and made them available on Wikidata, uh, Wikimedia Commons with this um, public domain statement that Wikimedia helped us write when we uploaded all those images to Wikimedia Commons. A lot of them were already available on Wikidata and had their own posts on Wikidata with, <clears throat> with not only more data than what we provided, but also as you can easily see in this Anvala uh, Costier portrait uh, a lot more international readable data. So here we have um, a piece of art where we uploaded the English and the Swedish data and uh, in a very short amount of time it suddenly got nine different language titles in nine different languages. So of all different collaboration projects, the ongoing collaboration with Wikimedia Sweden has been the most beneficial simply because giving our data to a community dedicated to spreading knowledge will multiply our audience that we reach with our con content enormously. Um, <clears throat> so having learned from this experience, uh, or what also Cora went into the problems of searching, it's not very likely that um, anyone who will try to educate themselves around uh, art history will surf into the National Museum's website to find out <clears throat> say what vanitas actually means. A lot of them will Google and Google will take them to Wikipedia. And this is where our collaboration comes in. This is my favorite example because this is actually a Danish uh, Wikipedia article about, about what is vanitas and it, the Danish article is here um, <clears throat> illustrated by a vanitas uh, painting which is in our collection. And this image will bring you right back into the National Museums a collection database where you can find our original data. As I said, um, <clears throat> this collaboration will expose our data to a, a very vibrant community who will start using those images and also the metadata in ways that we don't always can see and we don't always have to see them and we can never control them. But in the first week of being online, our first Im our images in Wikimedia Commons were used in more than 100 articles and they were viewed 104,000 times. In six weeks, they had 400,000 views and now they are, <clears throat> which is four years now, they're in over 5,000 articles and they have had 15 million views in the first half of 2020. And I really would like to add that we don't have any um, resources to actually follow up this work or to write on Wikipedia ourselves, uh, no matter how much I would love us to do that, there's um, <clears throat> not the possibility right now. So all these articles come from the community. Um, 
So what else did we do? This was, as I said, one of the most beneficial um, collaborations we had. But once the data was out there, we saw a lot of interest in our um, digital collections and more interest than we had ever um, <clears throat> than we could have ever anticipated ourselves. There's, um, there are apps that are specified and websites that are specified on spreading art historical information. And one of them is this, this app called um, Daily Artworks which uh, really uses our data a lot because they know they can just do it and they don't have to ask for a permission. There are uh, large Instagram um, profiles that really make use of our data a lot. There is a big Swedish um, furniture house <laughs> that use our, our images here just in order to um, construct an an image and what happened was that people asked them where did how where that can i buy these graphical works and uh, they were nice enough to say that all these images come from the national museum and they're free to use and you can go there and download them for yourselves for your needs so um, <clears throat> what i want to come back to is what we learned from all these collaborations is that in order to make our collection as available as possible, we don't really have to be the ones talking about it all the time. It's rather like that, that if we let other people take over the conversation as well, there will be um, other aspects of our collection that we didn't pay too much attention to, or also parts of the collection that we wouldn't highlight in the same way. Um, <clears throat> like this i'll just go this is my favorite example so this is a um portrait by martin van meintens the younger um it actually looks like this so there's, there's a recto and the verso and of course it's the most shared image of our collection on social media and we wouldn't talk about this image like that and we don't need to because people can use it to express whatever they need to express around our collections but um <clears throat> The most important thing here is that we don't restrict the use. Um, <clears throat> another very exciting collaboration that we had in 2019 was with the fantastic Scan the World project. So Scan the World is a community built initiative uh, with the mission to actually provide three open licensed 3D scans of sculptures in museums. And we worked with them for around a week, which uh, actually um, resulted in, uh, let me see, I think it's about 50 or 60 sculptures that we scanned, which are now available on their homepage uh, for any reuse and they're used greatly. As you can see, they have also been viewed already 35,000 times. Um, but I want to come back to what I said in the beginning um, because in the beginning I talked a lot about our internal needs and now I've been talking about uh, letting, letting go of control. So how do we get these two things together? And I think that the important thing is that without a strong connection between exhibition work, communication and document, and between exhibition work, communication and digital um, engagement, documentation, digitization and enrichment will always be seen as an extra workload for very very few specialists which very few can prioritize and where very few institutions actually can take part in and on the other hand you will only generate impact if you make sure that people inside and outside your institution understand that data enrichment is actually a collaborative effect which will need external dedication but which will also generate internal benefits and uh, with that, I have actually come to the end of my presentation. I want to thank you for um, joining me and I hope that it was kind of uh, understandable where I was getting it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Karin. Uh, it was a pleasure to listen to your pre presentation. Um, as always, I, uh, I'd, like you to, I'd like to invite you all to share your questions to Karin in the Q&A. Um, and I think we're going to start with a question that um, is concerned about digital management systems. Mm -hmm. um, 
you have also written a report for the Swedish National Heritage Board about choosing the right uh, collections management system. Um, I'm going to put that link in the chat. It's in Swedish, unfortunately, but uh, there are translation services on the internet. Um, so Karin, would you um, dive deeper into the issues that you might want to um, mm -hmm. think about when you choose a digital uh, management system? Yeah, as I said, um, or as I was trying to point out during my talk as well, I, I am um, convinced that uh, the technology and the infrastructure is only one part of the problem. So I think the really important part is that you, um, once you decide that you want to achieve, uh, want to buy, uh, acquire a digital collection management system, that you actually make sure that you have processes around it which will ensure that it was, is used widely in the whole, in, uh, whole institutions. Because most of them that are um, available on the market today are very powerful tools, but it's always, um, I have the impression that a lot of museums still see this as a specialist work. And I think we need to change the attitude towards that quite a lot because it needs to be a very, um, uh, what's the word? Um, like a, a, a very basic tool that everybody in the museum is able to use and actually uses. Um, so for a national museum, a lot of the change was about um, making people comfortable around this tool and actually having more people checking data, entering data and making sure that data was actually documented in the right way. Would you um, elaborate on how the processes of um, persuading people to work with the uh, collections management system internally um, worked? What was your argumentation, uh, to, uh, for example, um, with mm -hmm. um, colleagues um, that have never used those systems before? So what I tried to, um, to show uh, in the talk was that we actually um, put the collection management system quite into the center when planning exhibitions. So that's what I meant. You need to have a very clear internal use case for your data to make sure that everybody is engaged about this because you, it's not documentation. And when, you, when you're aiming at those stars that um, Cora was pain, pointing out earlier when she said like, well, there's no, there's no uh, case where all these visions actually work. And that's right, we're not there yet. But I also think like you cannot leave this to specialists. I think it needs to be uh, more of a collaborative work, even inside the museum. And for me, the, the, the way was to say like, okay, let's, let's start with those new collection displays. We will print all 5,000 labels from our collection management systems. And, and suddenly it was very important for all curators to make sure that all the data around their special collections was actually correct. And I've seen this uh, situation in a lot of museums that uh, people know that, yeah, we have a database, but it's kind of outdated and they don't rely on the data in there, but the knowledge is still in the institutions and we need to make sure that it actually gets into those channels that we can use with, with technology. Um, when it comes to, oh. There's another question. Um, and that's actually exactly the question I also wanted to ask you. Um, someone is curious about uh, the collaboration with Wikimedia Commons. How mm -hmm. does it work? What's the process behind getting your collections up there on their site? Mm -hmm. So I can only talk about how it worked for us in 2016. I don't know um, whether there would be any changes right now, but what we did was actually to um, to uh, pay or enter a proper project with Wikimedia Sweden where we paid them for some programming work which actually was to uh, take down take out our data or take a data export from our internal collection management system and upload that into Wikidata and we assisted with the mapping on that and then um, we provided them with a lot of images that were uploaded in uh, a semi-automatic process and I think a lot of the larger Swedish museums have went through have gone through similar uh, collaboration processes. Yes, 
Um, would you, you also mentioned that you work with volunteers and the community behind the wiki data, mm -hmm. wiki mm -hmm. media movement. Would you um, go deeper on that aspect? Well, as I said, we don't actually have the, um, the um, we, we don't really have the resources right now to follow up this kind of work. But what I tend to, to show is um, how the data looked when we provided it and how it looks now when you look at certain Wikidata uh, records now and how our collection has been used and classified and put into different contexts, not only uh, on the Wikipedia articles, but also when you dive deeper into, Wiki, into Wikidata, how it has been sort of, as I said, you, you classified in different, um, in, in different uh, surroundings. And um, something that we're looking that we were looking at last year together with the National Heritage Board was um, a pilot to re-import some of that data, and I think that would be a very interesting part for us to sort of when it comes to community tagging, for example. Like um, we could never have enough people to tag our um, our artworks, but all the tags that already exist in Wikidata would be very useful for us to re-import into our internal database. I think you're uh, talking about the um, round tripping project. Yeah, right? exactly. The wiki round tripping project. Exactly. And that's, yeah. we, we used a similar thing for um, making sure that our artists, re artist records actually have now links to authorities data like the Betty Union list of artist names because we uploaded them on, on Kuthunab and then they were in, our artists were in Wikidata and then they were enriched with other, um, with other IDs and we re-imported those IDs into our database. Hmm? Right, I also posted the link to the um, report on uh, the data around mm -hmm. tripping project in the chat. Um, something that I would like to ask you is to, uh, could you post the link to your IPI in the chat? Um, yes. um, mm -hmm. uh, um, in the meanwhile, the people get a little bit more time to actually um, ask you questions. But I think um, otherwise, my colleague Ursa also had a question. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. I think I wanted to jump in. You talked a bit now about collaboration with Wikimedia, and, and that is mm -hmm. uh, and that's really very valuable. But I was thinking a bit. Uh, I, I'm not sure exactly how National Museum. Uh, are you working at all with any of the art history uh, education, so like the, for the master students or anything like that, when when they are, uh, if they could sort of help with the metadata uh, in their yeah. projects? So that is that is quite a common um, thing that we do when we got interns from any kind of um, art history any art history students that um, applies for an internship at the National Museum, a very typical um, top uh, task that they get is, for example, to um, take a scientific publication and make sure all this data is entered into the collection management system. Because as I said, I, I think uh, there's a big structural problem and that is that often uh, research is carried out for a research publication and on the other hand, uh, data documentation is is carried out in in a different way. It's sort of and and so there, there's always this gap because often uh, research projects are also in externally financed, so they run their own little life when they are part of the uh, cultural heritage institutions, and it's often like that only when the project is finished do we get the the data, which is the publication. And I think we really need to think about ways to make it easier um, to get, for example, external researchers to work in the internal systems. Um, but right now, what we do is give um, students the publications and tell them, okay, just go through all these records and update them according to the publication, for example. Yeah, that, that kind of goes back a bit to what uh, Cora was talking about uh, before. Um, do you feel like uh, when you get these interns, uh, do, you, do you experience that it, there is a big learning process for, for, to make them understand what there's the difference of working with uh, collection management? <laughs> this, this, this is very difficult to answer politely. 
but um, I, I feel that for most uh, interns that we get, this is a quite a straightforward procedure. So a lot of them have worked because we're so used to, um, you know, databases in general. I mean, you know how to, you register for a course, you put date, your own data into like a catalog and registering an artwork or updating information on an artwork in a database is, is not so different when you're so used to using digital tools. But um, <clears throat> I think there's, there, in, in a way, um, there is still a problem in the existing staff. So a lot of people uh, that have been in the heritage sector for a long time feel that this is not part of their job, but there should rather be specialists who do this. And I think that's sort of the wrong approach. I think we need to make sure that the specialists see those works, th those tools as a very natu natural part of their work. So instead of researching and writing down my manuscript, I should be researching and updating the database and then exporting from the database and then base my manuscript on the export that I get. Um, and we have, we have actually succeeded in streamlining some uh, processes at National Museum like that, so that people actually update the database and pull out a report, but not all of them. And there's, it's we're far from all colleagues that are at the same level when it comes to it's a natural part of your work. Thank you. That's really interesting. Mm -hmm. So I have now, another question. Yeah, sorry. Oh, sorry. Was, no, no, go on. I was just going to say I've, I have now succeeded in uh, putting the API into the chat. And I've also taken the freedom to point to a certain object, which is quite well documented. But if you take away the last um, ID from the link, you get to all the objects. Hmm? Great. Thank you very much. Um, there's one more um, question. I think you've touched upon this, but are you going to use the enriched information on your own website? Yeah, well, the, the, the yes and no. <laughs> so I think, um, <laughs> I, I think the process will look so, as something like we will import all the, um, if, if you, we think about, um, well, let me start again. So if we think about the artist data where we actually imported um, <clears throat> IDs via Wikidata, you will, for example, find all those IDs now in the, uh, in the data that is provided by the API, but we don't show it on our website because it's, it's not something that uh, everyday user understands. And I guess when it comes to tags, um, the process would probably look like something that we will import all the tags into our collection management system and then probably um, processes, processes it in a way that we will check and probably sort of um, boil it down to fewer tags or something like that to make sure it is actually useful for our own search interface. I think that's a nice um, connecting point to what um, also Koralika said earlier. Um, keeping those humans in the loop um, when yeah. it comes to checking on uh, social tagging. Yeah, I will. Um, sorry, I, I just want to add one thing because I, I think something that is important to remember is um, when I talk about uh, how important it is to let other people reuse your data, this does, it doesn't mean that you give up control of your own source. I think that's very important to understand because um, we as National Museum, we're still in full control of our own own information and we will always be able to say like, oh, this is National Museum data and this is, this is what somebody else has said about our collection. And I think it's quite important to say that this, this is still, it's, there's, there's no problem in that. Um, because I, I think a lot of people think like, no, we can't sort of, do this sort of crowd crowdsourcing fund because we are the authority. We need to make sure that we say the right thing. And yes, well, we can never be sure that we actually know the right thing. Maybe somebody else knows the right thing. That's one point. And the other point is also that it, there's no problem in that. This is the National Museum data and this is uh, what somebody else put around it or made out of it. Yeah, I think it comes down to that people in our societies uh, have different perspectives on things. They see different things. It also happens in yeah. the analog and the physical space. If I come to your museum and I see a painting, 
Uh, I might think about something totally different. I might tag it in my brain in different categories than you might have done it exactly. in. Exactly. And, and, and the, the very important point to remember is that, as I said, often tagging, cataloging, documenting and so on, those are very marginal uh, or they tend to be marginalized activities in the museum everyday work. Because even for me, like when we open an exhibition, the, the exhibition is always more important than following up on an enrichment process project because there's no deadline. And um, I think that's important to remember that, well, if, if you only have a limited resource to dedicate to this work, why not make use of all those people that are very de dedicated around this um, and take their help? Hmm? Exactly. Let's get to the next question. Um, I guess that familiarity with data management systems at a given institution is also very dependent on the notion of community that you talked about earlier. Instead, as is my experience, that researchers go about building their own system all the time. Yeah, that is, that is another big problem actually, which is something that I've also experienced in sort of collaboration uh, projects where that were cross-sector. So, um, <laughs> There, there is this sort of idea that when you start a research project that um, you need to build a database from the scratch to uh, document your specific needs and your specific research. And um, I think that's also a very, it's a difficult issue because I don't, I don't really know how to address it because you, you can't say, well, you all must use museum databases from tomorrow on because they're probably not right. But I think, um, it's important that that um, you remember if you if you collaborate with a certain sector with a different sector, maybe you should sort of scan first what kind of tools are in use there before you sort of automatically assume that you need to build something new for your specific research project. Absolutely, mm -hmm. especially also when it comes to interfaces, which uh, um, Kurarika also uh, talked about that uh, they. Uh, really suddenly address actually the user's needs. Um, you talked about your users um, in the first half of your uh, presentation mm -hmm. especially. Um, how do you make sure that your users needs are actually met um, in the products you design? You mean the, our, the, the public users? Exactly, the users of your online products, mm -hmm. like the website, the collections, uh, the collections. So I don't, I don't think we're very good at that, to be quite honest. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, we have, um, as I said, we've developed a, this visitor guide app, which we actually, where we ran a few test um, uh, cycles before we launched it. But as it was such a short time, there, there weren't really a lot of those. And the plan was to actually run a larger test cycle after launch and sort of, um, what we did was we actually went for this minimal, minimal viable product when we actually launched the app. So there were a lot of other ideas that we wanted to put into the app, but we thought like, no, we'll start, we'll start with what we actually need. We need to provide information for all those sort of exhibitions that have a lot of um, artworks and very little labels. And we were going to run a big review, but that didn't happen because um, of different reasons and mainly because of missing funding. Um, but of course what we get, so what we have is that there's an easy sort of respond but or um, um, what's the word, feedback uh, link in, in the visitor guide app where you can actually mail in your ideas and you mail and, and you get a couple of questions um, where you can sort of um, leave more detailed feedback than only on, on the App Store thing. Um, and then we actually have a lot of, when it comes to the Visitor Guide app, in the museum we have a lot of front desk staff who go around and help people and they collect a lot of feedback around that. And then when it comes to uh, the online database, um, there is, there's also sort of like a contact mail where people ask questions and sort of uh, tell us to update things. I think that's the most common common we get there. It's more. It's not so much. Um, I would really like you to change this and this, or I would really like you to change this feature. It's more like I think you got the documentation on artwork X or Y wrong. Um, but I definitely think that we need to invest more time and uh, money into 
making sure that we actually meet the user's needs. I don't think we do that quite well. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you very much for your honest answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can always, you know, it's, it's, I, think, I think it's another thing in our sector that we, 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 we test those things ourselves. And then we think like, oh, this is brilliant. And um, with our visitor guide app, for example, all my colleagues think it's brilliant. It's really wonderful. And um, I, so they, they, there's this joke that everybody says like, oh, all the comments on the app store must be really interns or internal staff that have written that because everybody loves it so much. And I think that's, for, I mean, that, it's not really what I wanted, but in a way it's also fine because it makes it, it makes the whole institution move forward in the, in this digital transition. So even if I think we should do a lot more in gathering um, our external users needs, I think it's also very important not to forget that you actually are um, an organization with a lot of people. And if, if you don't get all those people in your organization on board, as I said, then, then digitization will always be the sort of satellite activity, um, which will be poorly funded and uh, come a long way down in your prioritization list. That's really, that's really true. Um, I think, um, especially when it comes to working with colleagues on digital, digital transformation, that's also mm -hmm. something that we all experience right now in times when everybody had to transition to home offices and so on, yeah. that you kind of are forced to use digital tools um, mm -hmm. in a very short amount of time. And I think there it's also important to remember that a lot of those things that are happening right now, all those quick fixes, I think that it's very, it's, it's brilliant that they happen, but it's not, this is not what will bring our sector forward. What will bring our sector forward is like a, a long sort of um, more strategic change as well, which also Carol uh, addressed, where people need to learn different things and where other tools need to become very uh, sort of everyday tool and not something only specialists can handle. Yeah, and especially also taking people on board. That's just what you said. Like you, if you yeah. have a strategy and if you have a, a long strategic transformation, then you yeah. actually can take those people on board. Right now it's more of, okay, we just have to do these things really quickly without actually taking those with, um, with exactly. you. Um, Okay, perfect. Um, thank you very much, Karin. Thank you. Um, I would actually um, uh, hand over to Anna, which is going to make some final remarks. Uh, Can I just ask you, Karin, it's like, um, are, are you continuing? Uh, how are you sort of continuing with this work? What is the, what is the plan for the near future for you? <laughs> Uh, Can I pass sorry. that question? Um, yeah. I don't know how many of you have followed the uh, latest news and the, the, because our institution is going to very serious financial problems right now, so I really can't answer that. I'm sorry. Yeah. The, the ambition is to continue the work um, like at, at the first time, with, firstly with, the, with completing the round tripping. Uh, projects and then uh, also updating all kinds of uh, exports to external platforms. But um, and then we were also looking at a collaboration with Google Arts and Commons via our, our API and updating and uh, connecting the API to uh, Swedish Open Culture Heritage, of course. But right now I cannot give any time perspective on that. Hello. Anna, you're back. Thank you very much. Lovely. Okay. Fantastic. I think having a background as a sound engineer sometimes helps with these things. Um, okay. I have a question for you that relates to content management system or rather a remark. Uh, Karin, thank you so much for your talk. I apologize that there was this problem with my headphones. Um, I have the following question for you. We spoke about content management systems today. And we spoke a little bit about content management uh, uh, system that we pick. And I, I'm not sure if you could expand a little bit on the role of organizational legacy, because I mean, we had a conversation before and we, have, mm -hmm. we had a conversation yesterday about controlled vocabularies, structured data, sort of bringing everything together. Sometimes people invest a lot of money on something and then five years after like, 
tops, I think, by statistics, statistically speaking, it becomes obsolete. Mm -hmm. So perhaps the need for looking towards generative infrastructures, things that we can use and reuse. Yes. How I would round up your, your talk. I mean, that, that's what I see as a very important point that you make. Of course, the, it, it is it is very important to keep that in mind, and I think. Uh, but th this this is sort of a, it's it's an unsolvable task for like a little or a medium sized museum. You will o you will always go with what is on the market and what you can afford. And I think the most important part to remember there is really that you, um, because what comes what becomes obsolete is the um, is the software, but not the data. I see. So the, the important thing would really be to make sure whenever you buy anything, uh, any new software, uh, that you make sure that uh, you can get out your data uh, in, a, in, in a reusable way. So, I mean, for, for a national museum, we started cataloging in, uh, in a digital database in the early 90s. And I think that this institution has seen um, maybe at least three different collection management systems and we're in the process of finding a new one as well or updating the one we have and um, as I said the important thing is always to make sure that you you can get the data and there on the other hand again that's where external uh, infrastructures are so important because if you actually succeed in exporting your data to an external platform like Swedish Open Cultural Heritage or Europeana then you must be you must also be able to get this data into the new system. So that's where you get like a double um, uh, use of that. So when you come back to the question, what should, like if you're a small and medium sized museum and you're trying to find a way to organize your collection in a digital tool, one of the most important things to look at is actually, can I export into uh, other services because that will also secure that you can actually use the data when the new software uh, after five or seven years will also be obsolete again. Mm -hmm. I see. So the, the, the reality of the user reuse has to do, which is also in your title, is the, the realization that we have to have exportable formats. Yes. And exactly. organized. So it all begins again on the concept of organization. It's, it's I think that was a very good Exactly. So that's, of course, that's the other part. Like, um, I, I tend to forget to mention these things because when you talk about museum collection management systems, it's also it's often uh, there. There are a few established systems that um, have uh, interchange not hundred percent interchangeable formats, but the data format is mappable to one another. And, and of course, this is this is where it is very important to look at the standards that are there and to make sure you comply to those standards. So to make sure that your data actually is reusable. And then it's the front end to, to it all, which is the sort of universal design interface, the, uh, you know, inclusive interface. Yeah. And there's a whole new other thing really related, yes. but still. Yes. So I, I, I think the, the front end design when it comes to museum collection management systems, uh, they, they, they really have a lot to learn when it comes to front end design. Um, and but then on the other hand, the more important thing is actually to make sure that the data will will outlive the the software really. Thank you so much, Karen, for being with us today. The, yeah, this was you. exquisite as always. Thank, thank you. you very much for inviting me. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, Karin for your talk today and thank uh, you all who participated today. Um, it was a pleasure to have you and uh, we hope that you enjoyed this webinar. Um, when you look at the program, you see that there will be another session next week on Tuesday. So if you want to learn more, um, you are invited to join us next week again.